Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to another Flycast Partners presentation. Today's a little special for us, uh, folks. We've got some, some great guests, and our webinar is on maintaining uh, business continuity. And this is not really a webinar. It's more of a discussion that we're having today. And I'd like to welcome our special guests from Texas Mutual. We've got Chris and Shyla here. Chris and Shyla, well, Sheila, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Welcome. And then, of course, we've got Bobby and Kyle, uh, two of Flycast Partners' best uh, and most experienced SEs. They'll also be joining us today for the discussion. But before we get started, I, let me introduce our organization for those of you that aren't aware. Uh, Flycast Partners is here to deliver a seriously amazing IT experience founded in staff by personnel that have many years of experience in the IT space. We took the best ideas from all these collective experiences and added the best components necessary to grow and become a leading value added reseller. We offer best in class implementation services and training in IT service management, IT asset management, IT operations management, workload automation, and batch processing, all using ITIL best practice. Our professional services team can easily scale up or down to meet the IT needs of any customer, regardless of your size, complexity, or budgetary restrictions. We offer implementation services both on-site and remote, as well as training to reinforce your company's long-term IT success. Our ongoing administration support service offerings will enable your organization to focus on those normal day-to-day -day operations. We want you to give us a call at 844-FLYCAST, that's 844-359-2278 with any questions you might have or visit us on our website. We're happy to chat with you Monday through Friday. If you'll notice, there's this little box in the right-hand corner, that's called a chat box. We have IT experts standing by just to talk with you. I also encourage you to check out some of the white papers and data sheets that we have on our site or even email us at info at flycastpartners.com. Folks, today is a little bit different format than what you're used to. We're actually going to have uh, our folks uh, start a discussion about the environment that they have been dealing with there at Texas Mutual and some of the things that they've had to face over the last couple of years. And particularly a year and a half ago, they already had to deal with a remote situation. We'll wrap this up at the end with Bobby and Kyle and further discussion. But throughout today, I encourage all of you to ask questions. If you have any questions, go ahead and put those in the uh, Q&A section of this GoTo webinar. And I'll actually probably unmute you if, if it'll let me <laughs> and actually have you ask those questions live. This is the first time I've done this, so bear with me as we move forward. Chris and Sheila, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Um, well, first, let me uh, start off by introducing myself. My name is Chris Wilson. I'm with uh, Texas Mutual Insurance Company. I am a senior manager in the IT department. Um, a little bit about Texas Mutual. We have approximately 1,000 employees located in four different offices, off, excuse me, offices uh, across the state. Um, we have about 700 in Austin. Is there any chance we can do something about the feedback, Rich? Uh, that, let's see if we can't to make sure everybody that's muted that shouldn't be. All right, has that taken care of it? Uh, much better, yes. There okay, we go, so, we're good, uh, excellent. Yeah, much better, thank you very much. Um, again, uh, but we have about uh, 700 employees in our corporate office, which is located in Austin, Texas. Um, a little bit about kind of our current environment, because uh, we have been and are currently going through a, uh, a, a radical update of our environment to uh, bring it current. We're calling it our technical strength, technical framework strengthening program. Um, right now we are on Microsoft Office 360 for Outlook, Teams, and Office in the Cloud. Um, we do have a mix of legacy and uh, cloud applications. Um, our strategy is to go cloud first if possible, uh, especially from a financial standpoint. Um, and uh, kind of we're looking at doing that in the next three to four years. Um, overall with ShareWell, um, we uh, started, we've been on ShareWell for about three and a half years. We did an extensive uh, uh, vendor analysis. At the point in time when we did the analysis, we were a, a heat user. Um, we did look at ServiceNow and several of the other uh, uh, key players in the space. Uh, but at that point in time, determined ShareWell was really the best fit for uh, our organization. Um, we um, actually really did a lot. Our main focus was um, replacing uh, three internal uh, components. Uh, we had used a product called Archibus, which was a facilities management tool for asset management. We used a homegrown application called Sark, which was written on a Lotus Notes database uh, for onboarding of uh, staff. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, we used Heat for incident management. 
Um, part of our rollout uh, also included uh, uh, rolling out a, 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 a limited CMDB for asset management. Um, now we're going to kind of bleed into a little bit more of the technical stuff, so I'm going to turn a little bit over this to Sheila and let her kind of explain what we've gone through over the last two or three years. Okay. And, can everyone and, hear me? We can hear you fine, Sheila. And before okay. we get started, we've had some more people, a lot more people actually add on, and and even okay. Chrissy saying hi out there. Chrissy, I, I appreciate you uh, putting out Q and A out there, folks. I want to let everyone know. Please feel free to ask questions at any time. Put your questions in there, and I will go ahead and ask those directly to Sheila and Chris, and uh, and get uh, the con discussion continue in the direction that you'd like to hear. Perfect. Okay. So thanks, Rich. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Sheila Desai, and I'm with Texas Mutual, and I'm a product owner, and I was uh, on the team that helped uh, implement um, ShareWell three and a half years ago. So, um, like Chris said, we implemented. A service catalog that included an onboarding workflow, incident management, and just asset management for the CMDB. Last year, we implemented change management and we matured our CMDB that included product dependencies. Um, in addition to ITSM, we also implemented four components in our business area um, that, in, that uh, relates to complaint management in the policyholder space. And we have four components that our business users use, and those is totally, completely separate from ITSM. So we're able to separate those components. Those that use complaint don't see ITSM, and those that use ITSM have no visibility to the complaint space. Um, okay. That being said, related to the pandemic, I will say that Texas Mutual had a relatively easy transition into working from home, and that's about 900 plus employees. Um, one of the reasons is a couple of years ago, we had a weather incident that for, forced four out of our five offices at the time to close, which identified a vulnerability within our bandwidth. So we had to make some changes regarding to VPN and the ability to remote in. Um, one of the recommendations was um, to actually disable the streaming video while working over VPN, which actually helped the response tremendously. So that that was that was a big win. We also um, improved our uh, VPN capability over the years because of that incident that we had a couple of years ago. So again, we were very prepared and very little changes or modifications had to be made as we transitioned pretty much all of our employees to working from home. Um, the other thing from a ShareWell perspective, because we're hosted, there isn't a dependency to be on VPN in order to connect to ShareWell, so that's a win. Um, we also created workflows within ShareWell so that it allowed our end users to access ShareWell, to submit requests, to ask for things um, regardless of where they are. So they're able to open incidents, submit requests for products, view status of incidents request, um, email notifications, approval. All of our approvals are done through email or the portal. Um, and we were able, um, easily able to generate statistics for management, especially that first week that we went on lockdown that showed the um, spike in calls that our call centers had received during that first week. So we were able to produce those numbers um, easily as well. So um, that's 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 you know pretty much our story in a nutshell. Um, and again, we'd love to hear um, if anyone has any specific questions about how we did things um, from either implementing or even how how things are running right now over the last couple of months since we've all been home for the most part. And one thing I will add, if it's not obvious, um, we did use Flycast Partners uh, to do oh, yeah. our ShareWell implementation. <laughs> yes. um, uh, we were involved, literally we were locked in a room with a consultant for, I think about somewhere in the area of six to eight weeks. So it was a, a very small core team. Mm -hmm. uh, we had already solicited uh, requirements from our business users, both on the IT and the business side. And uh, we just kind of, uh, again locked ourselves in a room and, and had a target uh, date to hit uh, from a rollout perspective but the uh, podcast was extremely helpful in that effort so i have a question for you both and, and knowing that you were prepared for this covid 19 situation long before everyone else out there but it doesn't mean that you didn't already scramble back in the day right because you had to scramble when you were trying to get all those uh 
all those remote employees during the weather issues that you were having. Describe that situation a little bit. How did your organization handle that? Because it's something that uh, that most organizations are not prepared for. It sounds like you guys were a little bit more prepared than most. Is, am I correct? Yes, I would say um, we come, first of all, uh, Texas Mutual has a reputation of being an extremely conservative company to begin with. Um, uh, our prior uh, CEO, actually two prior CEOs mm -hmm. ago, um, had already forecasted a pandemic. <laughs> this was yeah. probably uh, 10 or 12 years ago. Yeah. And so our organization had already prior invested mm -hmm. a lot of time and money in, uh, uh, in preparation for this event. Um, the weather event gave us a little bit more of a technical insight or a reality of, you know, what could happen when you try to throw a thousand users or 900 users on a VPN. Um, the way that we were able to address it during the weather cycle was basically uh, you know, notification to all employees that didn't, if you didn't require VPN access to do your job, get off of VPN. I mean, it was literally as simple as that. Uh, and uh, that, that seemed to alleviate the problem. Yeah, and I was going to say, in addition to that, so we've had various weather incidents over the years, much on a much smaller scale. So we were able to address some of those um, concerns at that time on a smaller scale, so which was easier to address. The other thing is all of our divisions have been um, promoting work from home programs. So already some of our areas, actually most of our areas have already either one or two days working from home a week, right? So they're used to the setup, they know how to log in, they know how to connect, they have the resources that they need or technology that they need at home or they can prepare for that. So over the years, we've, you know, we've encouraged it across all of our divisions. So I think that also helped us transition easier um, when this all happened all at once. I would say one of the biggest requirements that uh, our request, I should say that we heard, let's say post pandemic, were monitors. Monitors. Uh, that was probably our biggest issue is uh, yeah. we, uh, every single one of our workstations across the uh, organization is uh, kind of plug and play. You bring your laptop, you sit at a desk and it's set up. Uh, we have dual monitors. So coming from a dual monitor set up to a, a laptop screen at home was a, a challenge for a lot of employees and and uh, again the the company has been generous enough to mm -hmm. uh, allocate the dual monitors to those that have requested it at home so in in your take uh, especially after everything you went through about a year and a half ago how instrumental was building out a portal in uh, in sharewell uh, for your 1,000 end users and, and helping you to cope with your B VPN situation and everything else that, that went along with a situation where everybody was working from the office and all of a sudden virtually overnight they were all had to work uh, away from the office. You know, how instrumental was ShareWell in, in that, you know, during that situation? Well, it's one-stop shopping. Yeah, it's one-stop shopping, right? Everyone knows where to go. Um, again, if you're having connect, if you're having problems with VPN, you can also connect to the portal without it to report that you're having problems with VPN. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, again, it was people knew where to go, and everything was at their fingertips in one space, so you didn't have to go searching. Well, how do I? Where do I find this? Or if I need this, where do I go? We've really made an effort over the last, and it was a uh, a branding decision on our part. Mm -hmm. uh, we spent a lot of time on what were we going to call the ShareWell portal. We didn't really want to call it ShareWell. Um, we didn't want to call it SARC, which was our, our previous mm -hmm. name. And so we had, we had came up with at your service. Um, a, a lot of people have now referred it to AYS. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the past few years, it's really kind of, uh, caught on. I mean, it, it's literally a brand at Texas Mutual. It's you know, either Texas Mutual AYS or Texas Mutual at your service. So uh, I encourage organizations that if they are going to be deploying any type of portal like this, that they try to put as much of uh, items on that portal as they possibly can, uh, where you're pointing the employee to one location, uh, not go here to request this or go here to request that. Uh, right. We've even incorporated facilities um, uh, incidents into the uh, portal as well. Now we do have a, a question that came from uh, Chrissy and and Chrissy was asking what were the calls that you saw a spike in during that time period and it looks like Kyle was already responding to her but uh, what were some of the the spike 
uh, in calls that you had during that time period? I from so some of them were related to VPN. Those who haven't been used to working over VPN and unable to connect um, or needing their PIN number, you know, reset. Um, or some of them even having problems with their service providers, right? Trying to distinguish, is it a problem with the VPN? Is it a problem with the service provider? And trying to triage to whether or not you need, because I know some of the service providers had some bandwidth issues in the beginning as well. So it was a combination, uh, people asking for equipment. Um, hey, can I have a monitor or I need an extra power cord or, you know, whatever the case, what, whatever the case, it was a mix. It really was, it, it, it was a mix. There wasn't anything there wasn't anything global except for I remember there was one occasion where people were experiencing some response issues with VPN, which was identified. And then, you know, we made some changes as a result of that. So. Excellent. And, and I'm, go, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Rich. I was going to just going to ask um, when the, the virus broke out, did y'all make at that point, did y'all end up, creating or making any architectural changes to the portal? Did y'all end up adding some things, adding some new requests or building out some, some things there that weren't there before to accommodate some of these new needs? We, uh, no, we didn't. Yeah. I mean, no, Sheila, I mean, major, yeah, the majority of all of yeah. our requestable items, we, we've been criticized uh, for this in the past, but I think we have 270 some odd <laughs> items on our, uh, our portal. So you can pretty much request anything from a monitor to uh, a piece of software, to access to a system, to access to a building, mm -hmm. scheduling a conference room to be configured. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's pretty extensive. So you, are, you guys already felt like you had the, the service catalog there to, to support you through all the changes already. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. We even have a service catalog item to request to add something to the service catalog. Service catalog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome. great. And, so, and so guys, I'm sorry, Rich, this, this is Bobby. I just wanted to add on there. So it sounds like that I'm assuming the weather event was a hurricane. You guys are close to the coast. Ice, ice. Ice, yeah. Ice. Ice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know Texas. That's right. Well, yeah. fortunately for us, our Houston office, well, not fortunately, but our Houston office has only been, is only the, is the only office that's affect that has been affected by hurricane. Um, but no, it's been ice events. We've actually had an ice, okay. one, several ice events in all of our cities, but there was one time where it actually affected, you know, four out of our five offices. Oh, yeah. Everywhere but Houston. Well, well well, I, I guess my question probably is more around the what happened with the ice event because it sounds like the ice event really kind of opened you guys your eyes and got you prepared for for what came here in the last mm -hmm. few months. Yes. My, uh, yes. My, my my wife works for a, a healthcare management company. They manage rural hospitals, mm -hmm. and uh, they send everybody home when when this started. And so the next day, uh, everybody. Uh, called into the IT office to get a laptop. <laughs> oh, and, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I'm, I'm wondering, how did you guys tackle that? Not so much this time, but more back in the ice. Uh, uh, how, how did you track tackle the asset needs? Well, so for one, we've all been using laptops or I would say mobile devices for, gosh, 10 plus years i i can't even I, i've lose track of time these days but um yeah it's been quite some time so because we're pretty mobile within the office itself so we've had that ability um so i there were i mean very very few people that had desktops and even then we migrated them to laptops many 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 years ago so we don't really have you know stationary desks so to speak um but to and i had a thought and i just left it just left my brain. So that's maybe okay. I'll so I'll, I'll, with I'll the, this because I've actually had a real life event with this. So yeah, um, uh, we we all have been required. I hate to say required. It's always been heavily suggested that you bring your laptop home with you because uh, you never know when something like this is going to mm -hmm. happen. Um, now to answer your question, I dropped my laptop about a week ago and mm -hmm. cracked the corner of the screen and also cracked the power supply. Um, so I opened up an incident. Um, and uh, immediately was contacted by the help desk. Um, they, 
offered me basically two solutions. I could come into the office and pick up the, the re refreshed laptop um, from the security desk or they would mail it to us. So we had kind of put procedures in place um, to address that because we know people are going to drop it, especially me. Um, uh, occasionally, I said, it's just going to happen. You're not going to you know, miss those type of events. Um, we do have a very, uh, uh, what we call a critical uh, employees that are stationed there. Um, and, and fortunately, uh, it is not the, any of the help desk. It's people that are having to deal with uh, uh, print and mail uh, operations uh, are the, the people that are uh, still staffed in the building. Uh, but our help desk, I think, visits the office twice a week. Isn't that right, mm -hmm. Sheila? Something mm -hmm. like that? Yeah. And usually on event, if somebody has to pick up something. And I remembered my uh, thought. Um, the other thing that um, management did in our organization is created a emergency response team several years ago. So we've had that in play or in place for some time. So whenever we have weather or you know any kind of incident. So again, when this started to rear its ugly head in um, the states, they started having meetings in early January to discuss you know what if, what if, what if. So um, again, it was very, you know, it was coordinated. It wasn't decisions came lightly. It was initially like at first, the people who were working from home were those who fit certain categories. And then, you know, when the state made their decisions, then it was, okay, everybody's working from home. So, and even like, I remember the, uh, the communication prior to was everyone needs to take their laptop home in the event that we are going to go home uh, permanently, start taking your laptop home. So and I want to yeah, messaging was out there, you know, initially, again, we were trying to be as proactive as we could. Yeah, I was just going to say for, for a lot of, for everybody that's listening in, I, one thing I think that um, was a, a smart move on your part, and I think it'd be good for a lot of companies is to move in that direction towards getting away from desktops. Mm -hmm. where you're locked to machine you can have a laptop and still have your 30 inch monitor or mm -hmm. even dual monitors as you mentioned but that makes it so much easier when a crisis like this occurs just to unplug from that dock or unplug the cable and be able to to go home real easily versus yeah. if you've got some tower sitting under your desk um that makes that premise much more difficult so it sounds like you guys from a purchasing perspective um and a vendor perspective were already set up to make Correct. that your, a lot of companies have a lot harder time if they have to turn around and go and, you know, they've got yes. a thousand desktops and now they've got to buy a thousand laptops. And set them up and yeah. all that good yeah. stuff. So exactly. Yeah. And I will say one of the, I guess, the benefits of the pandemic is when this happened, we were still able to go back to the office to get whatever we needed from our you know, from the office to where before in a weather event, you're stuck, right? If it's ice or hurricane or whatever, now you you can't go back to the office to go get whatever you need, so. Right. Now I was gonna ask, because this probably applies to a lot of different companies. Um, do you see after all of the changes, after everything that's occurred over the last couple of months, do you see the remote work the remote workforce remaining remote? I mean, do you see a permanent change in the way you guys are going to work in terms of coming into the office? Or do you see this going back to normal whenever that happens? Or do you think this has become persistent, not just for you guys, but for everybody? It's a great question. And it's a question that's been asked in our organization over and over again, whenever we have town halls with upper management. So um, to be determined. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, have all seen, that's the answer we've been have getting. Yeah. Have y'all looked at anything that's shown? I mean, is is productivity still the same? Is everything working just as smoothly? I mean, other than if, obviously the hiccups in getting everybody pushed out to the remote sites, but does business still seem to work as it did before with everybody remote? Yes. Yes, we've uh, we've actually we recently, I guess, about two years ago, we uh, did an agile transformation. Um, we've been running statistics from a development standpoint, and actually not just development, but uh, uh, people that are practicing Kanban as well. And and so far, our, our actually our productivity has increased a little bit. Um, from an IT perspective. From an IT perspective. Yeah. Now I will say, from a personal standpoint, I, I do miss the interaction a little bit. Um, 
uh, you know, things along those lines and, and being able to, you, even though you can see face to face via camera, it's still not the same as it is in person. Sure. Um, but as Sheila mentioned, uh, uh, upper management has been holding off on answering that question. Mm -hmm. the, the standard reply has been, let's get through the pandemic and then we'll address yeah. it. Right. So yeah, I have I a question with the financial crunch. If, if companies start looking, start realizing that, hey, we can get rid of a lot of real estate and a lot of rental properties and 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 mortgage payments and things like that on buildings and facilities yep. if, if business can continue as normal and you can cut all those expenses i can see a lot of companies looking at that that on the balance sheet uh like you said once we get to the end yeah Most we just built one. this giant just, yeah, go ahead <laughs> sheila <laughs> Mm. Yeah, we just built this giant 200 and almost 250,000 square foot building a year and a half ago that we moved into. So. <laughs> of course. <laughs> exactly. That's always the way it happens. And now it's now it's sitting empty. It is very empty. Yes, it's it's uh mm -hmm. and in fact we're only uh we're only going to be sending back 30 additional people for the first round and those 30 people mm -hmm. will be there for 2 weeks as we watch the trend in uh uh, Texas either go up or down, and then uh, they'll reevaluate whether they're going to bring additional people in. But that, that's how conservative of approach mm -hmm. we've taken. So literally out of 700 approximately people at corporate headquarters, we're going to limit it to about 45 to 50 that will be there the first go round. Now, is that going to be in shifts? Are they going to be, are you all looking at things where you have workers coming in on alternate days and things mm -hmm. like that? No, it, it's just going to be uh, 30 additional uh, employees, uh, volunteer only, uh, mm -hmm. for this first round. Uh, they will uh, uh, be there for two weeks. Um, they will be tested, uh, I believe. Ooh, I don't know if they talked about testing or not. No, I they think temperature. Taking your yeah, temperature. temperature. They will be required to wear a mask unless they are sitting at their desk. Um, they will. I think they also mentioned they will only be allowed to leave the building for lunch. Mm -hmm. And that's it. One time, you can't go in and out of the building multiple times. Right. Um, and can't then, go to a restaurant. You can't sit at a restaurant. Yep. And then um, no, so that, no in-person yeah. meetings, no face-to-face -face right. meetings. No face-to-face. Okay, so even in the office, y'all would be right. using Zoom. Yes. Or, or something. Or go to be, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So I do have a couple of, of questions out there. First, I'm going to unmute Chrissy. Chrissy, I want to make sure that we got your, your question answered here. It looks like you're self-muted, so it's not going to let me do that. But Chrissy, <laughs> uh, let me know that uh, whether or not we got your question answered for you. I know that we did uh, reach out on that. Uh, I'm also going to surprise him and unmute Dean. Dean had a great question. Dean, go ahead and ask your question. I'm trying to unmute you as well, but you've got to unmute yourself. Uh, go ahead, sir. Yeah, um, actually, I think uh, Kyle had already presented it, but um, from an IT perspective or, uh, you know, from your focus, are there any changes that are going to be remaining as a result of the pandemic? But uh, I think Kyle had already presented that to you guys. So uh, elaborate on your question, Dean, in terms of things that we've adopted during the pandemic that will continue to uh, move forward and utilize. Correct. Um, such as, you know, as, as a result, are you going to keep the dual monitors that you've deployed just in case another pandemic comes, you know, just permanent changes that may have, you know, come into place as a result? Um, I doubt that, yeah, I doubt that the dual monitors that we've been delivering to people's homes will stay in their homes. Um, those will probably be uh, uh, brought back into inventory. Um, we had already deployed dual monitors throughout the entire building. Uh, as Sheila mentioned earlier, we really, uh, one employee can go from one desk to another. This doesn't happen very often um, with just their laptop. So we've designed it where the only piece of equipment that an employee owns and is responsible for is their laptop. Um, the docking station stays at the desk, the monitors stay at the desk, um, things along phone. those lines. The phone yeah, phone 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 yeah, so we had already made that uh, change when we moved into the new building. We didn't want to have to uh, waste IT resources on moving monitors around and laptops and docking stations and things along those lines. So um, that, that decision had already been made. But the, the equipment that we've rolled out to the homes, I anticipate will be reclaimed. Uh, that, that's my, my two cents on that. Yeah, no, there's been no discussion. Who knows? I mean, yeah, I don't know. 
yeah we'll see and you mentioned you mentioned phones so that's that's interesting so obviously you know no office phones and things like mm -hmm. that I know people have mobile phones but has all of that transferred all that communication transferred over to go to meeting and zoom and things teams. like that or are they teams. Using teams. for the for the most part it's been teams especially with a voice with voice however with our ivr so we have call centers between the help desk and we have an external call center um they use um soft phone which is an app okay. on their machine yeah right and because teams doesn't support the ivr or or at least it's we don't have it configured for that let me just say that gotcha so y'all didn't have to issue new mobile phones or nope just had just had them. just headsets yeah, perfect. Well, that's true. Yeah. That's true. I forgot about that. Lots of headsets. Yeah, lots of yeah. headsets. And Sheila and I, I'll be honest with you, Sheila and I interact probably, you know, four to five, six times a day. And uh, I would say, Sheila, in the past, we probably would have called each other on the cell phone, but we mm -hmm. have totally adopted Teams. Uh, again, yeah. it was rolled out to us maybe seven or eight months ago. Last summer. Like that. That yeah. Last summer. And yeah. we now are utilizing it for everything. It's It's been, I mean, document storage mm -hmm. conference calls the only thing that we have not been able to utilize it for is large events um you know such as what you're like you're conducting today we do use go to meeting and go to webinar as well we have we did have mm -hmm. to acquire a couple of licenses of that and then just recently we actually uh, uh acquired two or three licenses of go to training which is more of a a, a training and education tool um, some of our internal staff would go out and conduct training classes. Obviously, they can't do that anymore, and so they needed a tool or a mechanism to track attendance, sign off a little bit more formality than what GoToMeeting had. So, but of course, so GoTo had things time. like that. Do you see those some of those forced changes where you're you're forced to jump into new technologies like that? Do you see some of that sticking around at even oh, beyond? Yes. Definitely. Most definitely. Yeah, we we talked. Uh, in fact, I've had long long conversations with the training department because it came out of my budget um, to purchase the software, uh, and they said, "Well, you know, we'll be happy to pay for it because our our travel budget was going to go to zero. Um, so they they are having internal discussions now of whether uh, you know training moving forward can be all be done remote opposed to travel. Um, now that being said, part of our uh the, the power of our company and our organization is we have a safety services group that does do a lot of on-site visits so it'll be curious sheila i don't know if you have any insight into that how that's going to change moving forward right um, so yeah because yeah, a and lot of that know. will depend on the technology on the other end right because we can have the technology but then the recipient has to have the technology so yeah i'm sure it'll be a combination a combination of stuff yeah yes all right, and we have a follow-up question. Uh, Dean, go ahead. Yeah, so it, it seems that you haven't had a lot of impact uh, from the pandemic. And in order to get to this point, uh, did you have certain policies or procedures already in place, such as emer emergency preparedness uh, from an organizational standpoint? Or was this more of a proactive or reactive from the previous incidents that you've had how did you get to this point to be so successful we've we, we've really kind of prepared over the years um mm -hmm. i mean even our badges have a phone number on it that uh you are supposed to call if you think there is inclement weather or things along those lines we have lights throughout our building uh we call it a blue light warning so if we have any type of intruder uh, active shooter things along those lines those lights will go off um, we hold regular uh, fire drills and tornado drills um, we have a, uh, a, a i will say we have a, a complete dr plan in place um, however it is being revised right now in full honesty um, but we have done several DR uh, exercises over the uh, last, gosh, five to seven years. We have not mm -hmm. participated uh, in DR activities over the last two or three years, uh, given our move. And then we've also had several large projects um, on the business side that have uh, prevented us from doing those. But just even having mm -hmm. the uh, chain of command in order, there's a representative from each business unit. Uh, it is normally the senior VP. Um, and they have a very well-defined workflow of if this particular type of event happens, 
um, here's who you call, they have a meeting, they make a decision, and then they send out an announcement. So th there's a very mm -hmm. formal process in place. And we actually have someone that uh, possess, someone in that role for business resilience. So our risk office um, created a position about a year ago. Um, so we actually have somebody that this is this is now her, this is what she does. It's her job, yep. Yeah. So did y'all have to alter the service desk or the help desk staffing or you know mm -hmm. set up in any way with the pandemic or was it all just status? it was all there because they have been um they have been working from home um on a rotation basis for since we moved into this new building. So about a year and a half, they already have been doing that. Okay. I like I said, I think our biggest advantage is that we had already started to explore the work from home option. Right. Uh, and and it, it worked out some of the kinks, the things that people may need at, while they're at home. Uh, again, we were very, I say blessed, but we were blessed that we had the weather event that showed our, our VPN vulnerability. Uh, and so we were able to address that. Mm -hmm. And then even prior to the, the, the pandemic, uh, a couple of weeks uh, before that, uh, they were talking about things of ways how they could enhance the VPN. As Sheila mentioned, you mm -hmm. know, turning on live streaming if you're connected, things along those lines. So. Um, uh, again, for us, it's almost been a non-event, uh, not completely, right. but close to it. And the pandemic was the first time that we were able to test pretty much all of our employees, right? So we didn't know, like the most we'd ever tested with that big weather event was 600 people. So we realized, okay, we can't handle 600. So what do we need to do to be able to handle a thousand? So um, again, a lot of it you don't know until it happens. Right. <laughs> What are some changes, if any, that uh, that you may be making to ShareWell in the future to make things even better uh, from, from the lessons that you've learned? Or even if it's just for normal day-to-day -day operations, what are some of the things that uh, you have on your roadmap? As Sheila mentioned, uh, we're going to be addressing problem management. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Sheila and I actually, uh, again, in, uh, in full disclosure, uh, uh, we've, we have stepped out of the ShareWell space um, we, we've moved into a, 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 a role called uh, uh, Corporate Point Solutions, which uh, deals with all of the applications that are owned by the business that IT touches. Um, we still, Sheila is still very involved uh, from a CMDB standpoint, uh, and the handoff was actually made to the help desk. Uh, so we're really letting them kind of drive the direction. Uh, I think some of the things that uh, Sheila and I've talked about and in, in encouraging the new product owner to to look at is uh, more robust uh, onboarding and offboarding of employees. Uh, right now, we do have uh, uh, what we would call role-based modeling. Uh, we based it on the division that the uh, employee was being hired onto and their title, and we have already predetermined what software, hardware, and access that that individual needs. Uh, it would be nice to record all of that within the CMDB, and then when we offboard an employee, you go back and we capture all that information and hopefully automate deprovisioning all of it. Yeah. And so, I don't know if you have anything else to add on top of that? Yeah, our, the the other focus is an upgrade um, to version 10 so that we can take advantages of um, a lot of the new features and bells and whistles. So um, that's that's the big thing. So we're currently on uh, 921. No, this is great. I was going to ask, did y'all look at or work at all with the crisis management or the the remote employee management maps with Sherwell or y'all loaded anything like that? No, because it wasn't, like I said, there wasn't a need. There there wasn't a need. Um, yeah, where where you physically are located didn't really didn't matter. Uh, affect, yeah, it didn't affect it, yeah. other than whether yeah, or not you have what you needed. You have what you need wherever you are. Right, right. So it's, it's, it sounds to me like, uh, well, I, I, <clears throat> rather than put my spin on it, compare and contrast life right after, right during uh, the the ice versus right now mm -hmm. during the during the during the pandemic. Uh, it, it sounds to me like uh, the lessons and the, the the tough times were occurring during that ice storm. Correct. You guys responded to it, and so uh, planning, 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 planning. planning. <laughs> and I will say and that testing. again, 
improvement in technology over the years too helped, right? Because some of those ICE events were years ago where we didn't have the capability that we do now. Um, So that that also, you know, again, like anything, there's a lot more conveniences that we have now that we didn't necessarily have back then. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you guys have pretty widespread adoption and use of the ShareWell portal, Mm -hmm. um, which is in contrast to a lot of customers. Um, Did you guys do a lot of heavy marketing of that portal throughout the company, a campaign? And we involved our business users, um, our SMEs, in the whole um, POC process as well. You took their, you got their input all all the way through the build out? Yep, we did. That's great because that's, I think that's the the biggest piece that most customers fail when they roll out Mm -hmm. the portal is they just put it out there. And in many cases, they don't even send an email out. Uh, They might send a link or put a link on the site, but there's no... There's no campaign, there's no marketing behind it to explain to the customer why it's gonna benefit them and how they can use it, what they can get out of it. So kudos to you guys for for doing that because in most organizations- Yeah, one of the ways that we did that is we, um, I I wanna say a couple of months leading to our go live date, we put out an article, we published an article once a week coming soon, coming soon. And then every week was a different set of features. And it's like, oh, do you know you can be able to do this? You can do this, you can do this. So we got people excited. Um, and then our biggest, um, I guess our biggest challenge, you know, before ShareWell um, was onboarding. That was our biggest complaint from all of our end users is onboarding, onboarding and offboarding. It's just a difficult process. And it's manual from an end user perspective. And there was a lot of manual from the provisioning perspective. So that was our focus. And again, as Chris alluded to earlier, our um, work, our onboarding workflow is really what sold it, is really what sold it. Now, we still do get a lot of, go ahead. I was going to say, do y'all offer different, do y'all still take emails and phone calls, I'm assuming, in addition to the portal? Not emails. No, no emails. emails. So you've nope. got, oh, Wow. We did that on purpose, actually. You are truly truly rare then. You are. (laughs) It's an interesting because in the uh, user group meetings, we've had several of those discussions because I know there's a lot of organizations that still do both. And that was a decision that we talked about quite a bit because prior to ShareWell, there was an email address, right, that you could email the help desk to ask for things. And we said in order to force adoption, you need to get rid of it. Yeah. I hear from so many organizations when we're talking about self-service, or we Uh mention it, and I constantly hear, oh, that'll never work here. Right, right. That we can never get them off of email. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it's refreshing to hear, you know, from a customer that has gotten off of email because it's everybody's goal, but then 99% of the customers say we can't can't accomplish it. We can't do it. Yeah. Our goal is to take work out of email. That was... That was our goal. We no longer perform or track work in email. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, I had a, a I had a customer reach out to me the other day and said, "Can I try a license of this?" And I said, "Certainly. You go to at your service. You do this request, mm-hmm. and uh, we will take care of it from there." That was the other thing is is empowering the people that are receiving those type of emails to push back and and right. and, and educate. Yeah, train the individual or the staff on how to do that on how to do the request and and we've had uh, uh we did one rewrite of our portal um to give it a little bit more of a a look and feel like our internal website uh and then i anticipate we will do another one after that probably our biggest challenge in some cases with the portal has been uh, uh people are not sure what they need um uh, we've been t- we've been tempted to open up I, I, you know, I need this uh, free form text, but we fought it as much as we possibly can because we're afraid people then will request everything through that. I'm not quite sure what I want uh, instead right. of going right. through the education process. And then it just becomes a, an email, basically. Mm-hmm. That can, exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. I hope others on the phone um, have success in doing the same thing um, and trying to get rid of emails because. Uh, Everybody wants to, but everybody seems to think that, you know, 
there's just no way to change that paradigm within their company. But but there are. It's like you said, it just has to be a hard a yep. hard no. Rip really. the band aid. Yep. Yeah. But Gene, I, I'm I'm gonna, gonna tell you. Go ahead. Go ahead. I have a question from Jean out there. I'm going to try and unmute her, and if I can unmute her, we'll let her ask her own question. Jean, go ahead and ask your question. Can you guys hear me? Uh, we yes. can. Go ahead. Okay. Well, what we did is we set up an email, because we had a hard time getting folks to go to the portal, for sure, well, to enter tickets, especially when everybody went to a work from, we call it a work from anywhere environment, and I feel like you guys have been talking about my company, because we built a building. <laughs> two years ago that now we're wondering, do we really need? And in that process, everybody got a laptop and we were already pushing a work from anywhere environment. So you guys have been speaking my language. Anyway, what we did is we set up a, an email address, help at lifeway.com. And it's like, look, just send an email to this email address that generates a help desk ticket okay. <laughs> and puts it in whatever bucket it belongs to based on the text of the email. and that way it's just very easy so you're sort of breaking the email habit but not because it is generating a ticket and then mm -hmm. we work from the ticket that makes sense that works and, 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 yeah that yeah, works and, and what we did that was interesting is our when you open up an incident uh via the portal it looks just like an email it's got a subject line mm -hmm. and then a, a body where they enter in text in we kept it, yeah we kept it very very simple now we 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 decided not to have filters or it's like is it related to this this and this and then try to figure out whether or not they filled it out right and it goes to the yeah. right team so the help desk actually triages all those yeah sometimes that works and sometimes it does and i was yeah. i'm in charge of telecom so i was most concerned mm -hmm. about getting those offloaded immediately um just so we could attack them quicker um, at the time it was we had a lot of backup in our help desk so now ah. it's kind of smoothed out and we all kind of it works pretty works really well great and one thing and one thing i recommend for some customers that that have trouble getting off of email or they're trying they're working towards the portal is it's perfectly logical and reasonable to if you're using service level agreements to have different slas on your email requests versus the portal requests um, sure. as a way to direct customer behavior now you can you can say we'll still continue to allow you to create those email tickets. However, there's more time consumed in having you you're going back and forth. There's no structure to what the content they provide. And so it's perfectly reasonable to say your email tickets will have an eight hour response. But if you go through the portal, we can respond in two hours or four hours mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because we're able to put requirements on the data. We're able to automate some things. Um, and so that's another way for those that are you know, trying to get move towards the portal as a way to drive customer behavior is give them a better response level through the portal than you do via the email if you're trying to move that way. Yeah, we started to ask two questions on the request. Um, does this affect your day-to-day -day work and then is anyone else affected in your group and that changes the severity mm -hmm. of the team so, right. um, so that was an enhancement we made probably about a year ago mm -hmm. i actually oh, like then, the way yeah. sharewell does that better than any of the other tools versus simply asking you know majority of them just simply say what how urgent is this or oh, what yeah. priority do you want to put on this and of course it always ends up high priority high but high. by hitting those natural language questions mm -hmm. you tend to get honest responses um and then you can set the priority and the severity of it based on that versus just giving it a drop down one two three four five it's always going to be one always one <laughs> yep no never yeah. allow your customers like the way sure well does that. Never allow your customers set the priority. Is that what you just said, Chris? Yes. Yep. yep. I thought I heard that. <laughs> should be should be a mutual agreement between the customer and the help desk. Mm -hmm. Very good. Folks, this has been a great discussion today, and I really appreciate everybody participating, especially our audience. Uh, it's been great having you folks. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join our discussion. And a really special thank you to Sheila and Chris. Man, this is great. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us all. Uh, sure, it's a pleasure. It means a lot. It's been fantastic. It's very much appreciated, both of you. You're very welcome. Yeah. Enjoyed it. And 
of course, Bobby and Kyle, man, what what can I say, you guys? Always, you always uh, bring up the uh, great questions and and get us talking about some things that sometimes we don't think about. So thank you as well. I know you guys are busy, uh, folks. If uh, you want to share this video with uh, some of your coworkers, we did record this today, so reach out to us, uh, give us a call. You can chat with us, send us an email, uh, whatever that might be. We'll be happy to share this with you if you'd like to share it with some of your coworkers and uh, and show the experience experiences that Texas Mutual uh, has been through. With that being said, uh, once again, reach out to us, 844-FLYCAST, that's 844-359-2278, that's info at flycastpartners.com. We appreciate everything that everyone has uh, done to participate today, and with that being said, be safe until our next uh, webinar. Thank you. All right, have Thank a wonderful you. day. Thanks for having us. Thank All you right. so much. Take care.